You can go ahead and turn in your Bibles to Genesis 36, to where we're, we last left off. But I like to pray, and then I want to talk a little bit about Palm Sunday, Good Friday, and Easter Sunday. And I reflect on that a little bit with you. And then we'll jump into Genesis 36. But why don't we pray? Father, we thank you so much for this time and this opportunity, Lord, to study and learn, Lord, more about you. And Father, that's really what your word is about, is your revelation of yourself, that we might come to see and know and experience your goodness and greatness. And I pray, Father, that we would be in submission to you, that you would rule and reign over every aspect of our lives. And I pray that we would honor you, Lord, with everything we seek to do. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. So I want to just kind of converse with you a little bit. And I'm going to start with this question. Where in the Bible do we get the term Easter? Where in the Bible do we get the eggs and the bunny rabbits? We don't. You see, I have a difficult time when it comes to Sunday morning calling it Easter Sunday. Now, historically, the church, ever since the 4th century, has called it Easter. So it's been a long-standing tradition throughout the history of the church that the day we celebrate the resurrection of Christ is Easter Sunday. So that is the term that has been used in the Western church all along. Eastern Christianity calls it Pashka. And it coincides with Passover. That's why Eastern Christians, like Eastern Orthodox, celebrate Easter this year one week later than the Western church. When you think Western church, you think Roman Catholic and then all the Protestant denominations which we would be classified under. That's the Western side. But the term Easter, unfortunately, has pagan roots. It is the goddess Eoster that the Greco-Roman world used to worship for her fertility. She was a multi-breasted um, goddess, um, symbol of fertility. And why are eggs and bunnies a part of the celebration? Eggs are a sign of fertility. And bunny rabbits, because they, they procreate like crazy. And so the term Easter, bunny rabbits and eggs, have nothing to do with the gospel. They don't. Um, so that's difficult. But what ended up happening is Christianity was persecuted in the Roman Empire for the first four centuries. Then came Emperor Constantine. And he came to power. And he was a pagan like all the other Romans. But then there was, the Roman Empire was divided up among its generals. And they were all vying for power. Who was going to lead the empire? Constantine was one of, I think it was three that were battling it out. And he ended up seeking out help from all these other deities. None of them worked. And then one day he supposedly saw a burning cross in the sky. And it said, by this sign, conquer. So he put the cross on all his military men's uniforms and they won a great battle that day and from then on the christian god was his god so he did away with any persecution of christians it was now became the roman religion christianity did and he took all of the pagan holidays and christianized them so the winter solstice became when the sun is supposedly born you know, the sun in the sky became the day, December 25th, the day that we celebrate the birth of God's son, Christmas. Easter, in the spring, time of fertility, the worship of Eoster, was replaced, instead of new life physically speaking, eternal life spiritually speaking. And the resurrection was focused upon. Now, is that bad? Should we celebrate Christmas and Easter? Well, I think God's a God of redemption, and he takes things that were used for pagan purposes and use them for his purposes, doesn't he? Aren't you and I an example of that? We were used for pagan purposes, and God repurposed us? 
and has redeemed us for his purposes. So there is nothing wrong with celebrating the birth of Christ on the date that we do or, you know, Resurrection Sunday on that day. I just hate, I really don't like the term Easter because once you know that, it's like it ruins it for you, right? But everybody knows Easter holiday, so it's kind of a catch-22. It's what people are familiar with. Mm-mm. No, no, we don't know the exact day. Um, Jewish Passover, the way the calendar works, it's kind of revolving, and it's not always on the same time. Passover isn't, but when Christ was crucified, it coincided with Passover. Uh, but you'll notice on your calendar right now, this year actually, I think it did, right? Yeah, it actually coincided this year, which it hasn't for a long time. So one of the first times in a while. It should coincide with Passover every time. I mean, if we want to get technical. But anything, I want you to think back on Palm Sunday and the parable of the tenants, the wicked tenants, into Good Friday, into Resurrection Sunday. Did anything stick out to you that surprised you, that maybe you learned or that hit you in a new way this year? If you say you don't remember what we studied, <laughs> I failed in my job. I, I think when you talk about um, when Christ went in and, and threw out the money changers. Yeah. And that I had never had it really brought to light that he was going to be the final sacrifice during that time. And that's why he threw out all that. Yeah. And uh, so that, that was uh, enlightening. That's cool. Yeah. Yeah, I like that one too. Anybody else? Don? I never realized how much David had prophesied the crucifixion of his life. Right? Yeah. yeah, so many of Psalm 69, Psalm 22, I think Psalm, I mean, so many of them. Yeah, a lot of David's Psalms point right to the Messiah. And case in point, why Jesus is referred to as the son of David. It, that close connection there as well. And that the righteous rule of David is a precursor to the reign of Christ. But yeah, but definitely some messianic prophecies there. Rosie? For me, the parallel to the creation days mm. was Psalm 69, the Right. So if you guys remember that, that was the six days of creation and the six days of Christ's passion, and then the Sabbath rest on the seventh day, and so on. Yep. I love the connection with Adam's birth. Mm. Right. Yeah, it's, it's really, I get super excited about those connections when you see the whole plan of God coming together. And when you see all that the New Testament says about the first Adam and then the second Adam, which is Christ, and how through one man came sin and one man came righteousness. And out of the one man's side came his bride, Eve, but sin came through that. And then you have through Christ on the cross, through his side, came his bride, the church, that he gave himself up for us. Uh, It's just amazing to see those connections. And then sin came through Eve, and she was the first person who gave the wrong message, take and eat of this. And then you have Mary Magdalene being the first eyewitness that gets to share that good news with humanity. It's, It's beautiful how God wrote wrote this story in humanity's redemption. Anybody else? Right. Yeah, that one, when you start to read about the mercy seat more, and for me, it was that, that God said from that place he will meet with us and speak with us. And the blood of the sacrifice being on the seat. And clearly, Christ, with all the blood he lost, is on that mercy seat in that tomb. I mean, yeah, I I love that one too. Really neat, neat connection God has there. Now, one thing we... Yeah, go ahead. One of a a lot that really struck me this, this Resurrection Sunday. Hey, there you go. <laughs> but, uh, one was when Christ was. <laughs> okay, I'll shut up. 
coming. <laughs> yes, Christ is coming. <laughs> but that, he was a Passover lamb. Yeah. But that he was on the cross exact time all these Passover lambs were being sacrificed. Right. And you know that really, it, I kind of knew that, but it, it really struck. Me yeah, it really sp- struck home this year. That's excellent. I think one of the things that the reason why I asked that, I wanted to lead into it, is throughout God's plan for human history, you have that concept of the new humanity, um, redeemed humanity. And you see it with Adam and Eve and God created man. But then man fell into sin and God had a plan to redeem humanity. And so you see the first inkling of that with Noah and his family. God's, God's ready to wipe everything out. And God ends up showing grace and favor to Noah and his family. Wipes out all living creatures except those that were in the ark. And that's really a a start over. Right? Creation starting over with Noah and his family. But sin, they brought it on the boat with them. Right? They couldn't escape it. So then you see it start to play out again. And then God ends up calling Adam. I mean, Abraham out of the nations to be his own special people. And now Israel, through Abraham, Isaac, Jacob, which becomes Israel, and his 12 sons, or the 12 tribes of Israel, you have a new humanity that is meant to be separate and holy from the rest of the unbelieving world, to be a light to the nations and a witness of God's goodness and greatness and His love and mercy. And yet, they brought sin with them as well. And then you have all these different scenarios, even with David. David was going to be a new type of king. Saul was the earthly type of king. David is going to be the king after God's own heart. But even with David, they go awry. So they all fail, but they all point to Christ, who then makes it all right and creates the new humanity that is actually spiritually alive, redeemed, and regenerate by His Holy Spirit again, which is a picture of our glorified state in which sin will completely be done away with and we won't be taking sin with us into God's holy presence and into his kingdom. Amen? Amen. So the thing that I want to highlight tonight about Genesis 36 is I am going to read a ridiculous amount of weird names. (laughs) So I know you're super excited, right? This is the one where pastors go, oh yeah, I'm just going to skip that chapter. But I'm just going to read some. I'm going to explain a little bit. But remember, Genesis, who wrote the first five books of the Bible? Moses. Now this was a long time after many of these things happened. How did Moses get all this firsthand information? Okay, God. And what we don't realize and what you don't see practiced in our culture is oral tradition. Now, oral tradition, we think of it as completely flawed. You ever played the game telephone? You say one thing to this person, you got 20 people down the line. By the time you started off with the dog chase the cat, you've got a trash man running down, you know, a 57 Chevy. Like, that has no relation whatsoever. But that's because in our culture, we don't learn to retain information in story form, and those stories are not repeated around the fire at night. These cultures, before the written word was a part of keeping history and chronicling it, there are cultures that are primarily oral in their traditions. And they have shown historically that those cultures have an accuracy to their account of historical events that is on par or better than the written form at times. Because this is why. You have the elders who are skilled in relaying the information. It's the same stories, the same names, the same events shared for generations So if you've lived for 60 years and you've heard the same account of when God flooded the earth and then some young dad comes up 
tells the story one night and he gets one detail wrong, are you going to let that slide? The culture self-edits itself. They keep track and they correct anything that is off because you have a whole circle of people who learn the same historical accounts in the same way. And if anybody veers off it, they correct it within the culture. So many of these accounts can be relayed throughout generations with extreme accuracy. But then you have the supernatural side that God can give all the details in perfect you know, remembrance, right? So Moses is writing the first five books, including Genesis, which we're studying. Do you remember his purpose? Well, who is he writing to? Who's the original audience of Genesis, Exodus, Leviticus, Numbers, and Deuteronomy? The Jews, but which generation? Okay, the Jews of the Exodus. Remember, they have no idea who they are, really. Their identity had been devastated for 400 years of slavery in Egypt. They just thought they were just slaves. That's all they've ever been. That's all they've ever known. My grandfather's 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 grandfather was a slave here. So am I. But then God says, no, no, no. I am the God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. They're like, who's that? Oh, those are your forefathers. And so God gave them a lesson in who they really are, revealing their true identity. And so he traces it all the way back from creation, all the way through Abraham, Isaac, Jacob. And so they are learning who they are as the 12 tribes of Israel. But this generation is also supposed to go into the land of Canaan that God promised to Abraham and his descendants, and they're going to have to fight to acquire that land from those who are living there at the time. So it would be helpful if you're going into enemy territory to have some background on your foe, correct? Genesis also tells us where certain people groups came from, like the Amalekites, like the Hivites, the Parasites, all these different ites, but the Edomites, they become a real problem for Israel. They are their closest relatives because the Israelites came from Israel, whose name is also Jacob. The Edomites came from Jacob's brother Esau. Okay, so that's why these generations are mentioned right before we get into Jacob's sons, specifically Joseph. And that fills in the rest of the whole book of Genesis. I just want to read the first paragraph of Genesis 36. Notice the first sentence of every paragraph is going to give you a key of what it's talking about. These are the generations of Esau, that is Edom, or the nation of Edom. Esau took his wives from the Canaanites. Is that what Jacob and Esau were supposed to do? Remember, Isaac and Rebekah are like, I pray that our sons do not take wives from the Canaanites. And after Esau sold off his birthright and lost the blessing, he's like, forget you guys. I'm going to go get a wife from the Canaanites. Not only one, but I think it's about four he gets from these pagan people groups, which he was not supposed to do. Here's a list of his wives. Ada, the daughter of Elon, the Hittite. Oholibama the daughter of Ana, the daughter of Zibion, the Hivite, and Basemath, Ishmael's daughter, the sister of Neboioth. And then here's the sons born to these wives. Ada bore to Esau Eliphaz. Basemath bore Ruel, and Oholibama bore Jeush, Jalem, and Korah. These are the sons of Esau who were born to him in the land of Canaan. So it tells us these are the generations, And these are the sons born in the land of Canaan. That is the whole point of this section. Now notice one of them. Oh, I think that's in the next one. But one wife, Ada, is the daughter of Elon the Hittite. So that's the background. But what's interesting is there is a wife of Esau is not mentioned right here. Look at Genesis 26, 34. Genesis 26, 34. It says, when Esau was 40 years old, 
He took Judith, the daughter of Berai, the Hittite, to be his wife, and Basemath, the daughter of Elon, the Hittite. We heard about Basemath, but not Judith. What happened to Judith? Well, could have died. This is about Esau's sons. Doesn't mean he didn't marry Judith. He did, but she probably didn't bear him any sons. So she's not mentioned in this genealogy right here because there's no sons that were born to her and Esau. Look at verse 6 through 8. This section, so we talk about the wives and then the sons. This does some of the same things. These are the generations of Esau, and it highlights him as the father of the Edomites. Then Esau took his wives, his sons. Actually, this is his settlement, the land itself. Then Esau took his wives, his sons, his daughters, and all the members of his household, his livestock, all his beasts, and all his property that he had acquired in the land of Canaan. He went into a land far away from his brother Jacob, for their possessions were too great for them to dwell together. The land of their sojourners could not support them because of their livestock, so Esau settled in the hill country of Seir. Do you remember when Jacob was 20 years away from his brother Esau because he had tricked him out of his birthright and stole his blessing, Jacob thought Esau was going to kill him once they were reunited. And Jacob sent all these caravans of livestock and his wives and his children bowed down at Esau's feet, said, I am Jacob, your servant. And Esau said, what are all these gifts? And he said, for you, my Lord. And he said, I have more than enough. So Esau had all of these belongings. So did Jacob. Esau got all of his belongings in the land of promise. But now that Jacob was back, and Jacob is the one who had the blessing and the birthright, it was time for Esau to leave. He could have put up a fight, but I think this is where the blessing and the birthright come into play. Because what Abraham left to Jacob, to Isaac, and Isaac left to Jacob, not to Esau. So that land belonged to Jacob. So Esau decided to leave, and he settled in the land of Seir, which ends up becoming, it's called Edom, which means, do you remember what Edom means, anybody? What is it? Red. Why is it named red? Okay, that's one of the reasons. Esau is ruddy or of red complexion, also hairy. Two, he sold his birthright for what? Red stew. And the land of Seir had red sandstone all throughout the area. So that's why it's called Edom. And Esau's descendants become known as the Edomites. Now, let's look at the next section. We'll talk about the generations and the Edomites specifically. Verse 9, these are the generations of Esau, the father of the Edomites in the hill country of Seir. Now, remember, the Israelites are going to have a problem with the Edomites during the time of Saul, during the time of David, during the time of Solomon. The Edomites, Esau's descendants are a thorn in the side of the sons of Jacob, the Israelites. So these are the generations of Esau, the father of the Edomites, in the hill country of Seir. These are the names of Esau's sons. These should sound familiar. Eliphaz, the son of Ada, the wife of Esau. Rule, the son of Basemath, the wife of Esau. And then the sons of Eliphaz. Okay, so these are the grandsons of Esau. Temen, Omar, Zepho, Gedim, and Kenaz. Then a little background. Timnah was a concubine of Eliphaz, Esau's son. She bore Amalek to Eliphaz. Okay, Amalek, Amalekites. Okay, these are the sons of Rule. Remember, the Amalekites are the ones that King Saul was supposed to wipe out completely. And he did not wipe them out. He spared Agag, the king, and the best of the livestock. And that's when Saul is rejected as being king because he did not obey the word of the Lord. He rejected it and God said, I'm going to take the kingdom away from you and give it to someone better than you. And what does Samuel the prophet do to Agag? 
hacks him to pieces because Saul would not do what he was called to do. So these are the sons of Ada, Esau's wife. These are the sons of Ruel. So the second wife, Nahath, Zerah, Shammah, and Mizah. These are the son of Basma, Esau's wife. And then lastly, these are the sons of Oholibamah, the daughter of Anna, the daughter of Zibion, Esau's wife. She bore to Esau Jeush, Jalem, and Korah. It's interesting, there's no grandsons are mentioned to Oholibamah. This section dealt with the sons and grandsons, but this third wife, her sons, there's no list of them having sons. I'm not sure why that is, but they should have been mentioned in that section, and they're not. Now, we get to the chiefs of the sons of Esau, verse 15. We're going to start speeding through this, because 15 tells us about the chiefs. Uh, starting at verse 20, it tells us about the native people of the land of Seir that Esau chased out, but that were still living in the area. Then we get to the kings of Edom and then the chiefs of Esau again. So let's look at the chiefs real quick. Verse 15, these are the chiefs of the sons of Esau, the sons of Eliphaz, the firstborn of Esau, the chiefs Temen, Omar, Zepho, Kenes, Korah, Gadim, and Amalek, these are the chiefs of Eliphaz. So one of the grandsons, Amalek, is included in the chiefs. Um, verse 17, these are the sons of Ruel, Esau's son, the chiefs, Nahath, Zerah, Shammah, and Mizah. These are the chiefs of Ruel in the land of Edom. These are the sons of Basemath, Esau's wife. Lastly, these are the sons of Oholibamah, Esau's wife, the chiefs, Jeush, Jalem, and Korah, these are the chiefs born of Aholibama, the daughter of Anna, Esau's wife. These are the sons of Esau, that is Edom. These are their chiefs. Then we come to this next section. These are the sons of Seir. So these are the natives, not Esau's descendants, but the natives in the land. Uh, the sons of Seir, the Horite, the inhabitants of the land, Nodin, Shobal, Zibion, Anna, Dishon, Ezer, and Dishon, these are the chiefs of the Horites, the sons of Seir in the land of Edom. Edom. The sons of Lotan were Hori and Hemam. These are horrible names, are they not? And Lotan's sister was Timnah. These are the sons of Shobal, Alvan, Manaham, Ebal, Shepho, and Onim. These are the sons of Zibion, Ai and Anna. He is the Anna who found the hot springs in the wilderness as he pastured the donkeys of Zibion, his father. These are the children of Anna, Dishon, and Holy, Holy Bama, the daughter of Anna. These are the sons of Dishon, Hemdan, Eshban, Ithran, and Charon. These are the sons of Ezer, Bilhan, Zaavan, Akan. These are the sons of Dishon, Uz, and Aran. These are the chiefs of the Horites. The chiefs Lotan, Shobal, Zibion, Anna, Dishon, Ezer, and Dishon. These are the chiefs of the Horites, chief by chief in the land of Seir. We've been doing tongue twisters with the kids lately. <laughs> Woo! Okay, that is a whole list of the pagan people living in the area, their chiefs. Now, this is important in verse 31. There is a kingdom established before Israel. There are kings in place before Israel. It's the Edomite kings. While Jacob was trying to find a wife, Esau was busy raising up a nation, kings being established. So verse 31 says, these are the kings who reigned in the land of Edom before any king reigned over Israel. Remember, Israel was a monarchy for a long time. Actually, it was a theocracy before it was a monarchy. God ruled over Israel. There was no king until Saul. So it was much later that the monarchy was established. God ruled over Israel while all these other nations had men rule over them. And that's the point being made there. Here's the kings. Bela, the son of Beor, reigned in Edom, the name of his city being Dinhaba. Bela died, and Jobab, the son of Zerah of Basra, reigned in his place. Jobab died, and Hushem of the land of the Temanites reigned in his place. Hushim died, and Hadad, the son of Bedad, who defeated Midian in the country of Moab, reigned in his place, the name of his city being Avith. Hadad died, 
and Samla of Masreka reigned in his place. That name Hadad is very important later. It must have been an important name in the history of these Edomite kings because you have King Saul, then King David, and King Solomon. King Solomon had an adversary named Hadad the Edomite who caused him great trouble uh, during his early years. And so you can look him up in 2 Samuel, I believe, Hadad the Edomite, but we'll get to that later. Then Hadad died, and Samla of Masrika reigned in his place. Samla died, and Shal of Rehoboth on the Euphrates reigned in his place. Shal died, and Baal Hanan, the son of Akbor, reigned in his place. Baal Hanan, the son of Akbor, died, and Hadar reigned in his place, the name of his city being Pau. His wife's name was Mahatabel, the daughter of Matred, daughter of Mezeba. Now, why do I read all of these? Because they are important to the Israelites to understand the lineage of the kings in Edom. The Edomites are problematic for Israel when they leave the Exodus. It's probably why Moses devoted some time to these generations because when the Israelites were passing through and they were trying to go to the land of Canaan, they wanted to use what was called the king's highway. This is in Numbers 20, I believe. They wanted to use the king's highway. It was a very popular trade route that passed through the land of Edom. They wanted to use it to get to the land of Canaan, the promised land. The Edomites forcefully chased off the Israelites, even though they were relatives of one another. The Edomites mistreated them again and again. And yet God told the Israelites, you are not allowed to hate the Edomites because they are your brothers. Nor were they allowed to hate the Egyptians either. That's in Deuteronomy. So let's look at this last paragraph and then I'm going to give you an interesting background to what happened to the Edomites. Do you hear about them living in the world today? Nope. Because there was a prophecy in Ezekiel 35 that God would make their house desolate because of what they did to the Israelites. The Edomites don't exist in the nations anymore. Israel, however, does. So, verse 40. These are the names of the chiefs of Esau according to their clans and their dwelling places by their names. The chiefs Timnah, Alva, Jetheth, Oholibama, Elah, Pinan, Kenaz, Teman, Mibzar, Magdal, and Iram. These are the chiefs of Edom, that is Esau, the father of Edom, according to their dwelling places in the land of their possessions. Now, this whole history of the Edomites versus the Israelites obviously started with Jacob and Esau. What's unique about Jacob and Esau's relationship? They're twins, okay? Virtually born at the same time. However, Esau came out first and Jacob came out second doing what? Holding on to his heel. Taking what was his. And that's what defined Jacob for most of his early life until God got a hold of him, wrestled him into submission, dislocated his hip and changed his name and made Jacob Israel and changed his heart. But that rivalry was prophesied about in Genesis 25, 23, where it says there are nations within your womb and the older will serve the younger, meaning that Esau's descendants, the Edomites, would serve the Israelites. They would be in subjection to them. So King Saul, during his reign, fought against the Edomites and devastated them militarily. King David subjugated them, meaning they came under his control or his authority, and he put military garrisons in the land of the Edomites. The same thing the Romans did to the Jews during the time of Christ. They put garrisons in Israel to keep the peace over the people that they had conquered. So the Edomites were conquered by the Israelites during the time of David. Now, the Edomites religiously were pagans. They worshipped the fertility gods like many of the Canaanites people because Esau married Canaanite women. Those Canaanite women 
brought their religious practices with them, and that shaped the family of Esau. The same thing started to happen to Solomon. Remember? He married all these foreign wives, and it says that they started to lead his heart astray to worship other gods because the husband wants to please his wife. Oh, Solomon, dear, can I please bring my false god with me? Well, you're a very attractive young lady. How can I say no? Bring all your gods. But I really want to baptize our, you know, our sons into the cult of Ashtoreth. Can we do that? Sure, honey, whatever you want. He's like, I got 400 other wives I got to keep happy. Do whatever you want to do, right? And so that pattern of false worship coming into the family and it going on for generations very clearly happened with Esau. Now at one point, the Edomites were conquered by Israel and many of them were forced to convert to Judaism. But later, when Greek became the language of the known world and the Roman Empire came to rise after the Greek Empire, the Edomites became known as Idumeans. The Idumeans. Why is that important? Well, there was a father who was an Idumean who converted to Judaism who was made the king over Judea. His name was Herod the Great. Herod the Great, who is the one during the narrative of the birth of Christ, ended up sanctioning the massacre of all the boys, the young children who were males in Bethlehem trying to kill the Christ child. That was Herod the Great. He was an Edomian who was an Edomite. He was Esau's descendant reigning over Judah. That's why the Judeans hated him and he hated them he was not one of them the romans put him in power the israelites did not so he was of the lineage of esau isn't that fascinating to see how that played out and um, not only that during the time of saul if we go back some more do you remember when david was fleeing from saul and he went to the city of Nob, and he got supplies from the priest, Ahimelech. Who was the dirtbag who told King Saul that David was there? Doeg the Edomite. And who slaughtered all the priests of God in the city of Nob? Doeg the Edomite. Do you see why a whole chapter of boring genealogy can actually be pretty cool when you realize, wow, this is the fallout of a man who sells his birthright for a bowl of red stew. A man who takes wives and disregards his parents' instruction and forsakes the Lord and does not follow him any longer and how that plays out in generation after generation. But how when we follow the Lord, the blessings that are there for the generations after us. And that's what you see in the lineage of Israel, even though so many of them were faithless or lost faith, God remained faithful. God blessed those who were faithful to him and established their house and their lineage. And God did not allow the descendants of Israel or Jacob or Abraham to be a desolate house, but God has preserved them throughout the generations of the world when they should have disappeared a long time ago. And they are a picture of God's covenant people. There's one covenant of grace we, being believers, have been grafted into that family line of Abraham. And God says, do not be proud that you have been grafted in. Because if I have cut off branches that were naturally a part of that vine, what makes you think that I will not remove those that are unnaturally grafted in? 
And he's saying that to the church in the New Testament. Do not be prideful over your Jewish brothers and sisters who because of them you have been grafted in. But pray for their salvation that they might come to know Christ and be forgiven of their sins because they have the lineage and the covenants and the heritage that is so rich but not benefiting them at this point, many of them. Because the gospel says that when many Jews today read the gospel, they have blinders on because the God of this world has blinded them. We need to pray that not only our Jewish brothers and sisters, but all those who don't know Christ, that they would hear the gospel, that the blinders would be removed, their ears would be opened, their hearts softened, that they might come to share in the riches of Christ and being his son or daughter. Amen? Amen. Let's pray. Father, we thank you for just these connections we see throughout your history. It's your story, your plan. And Lord, you are Lord over it all. And I thank you, Lord, that you've given us some insight tonight into the dynamics of the Israelites and the Edomites. And I pray, Father, that you would help us to be of the faith of Abraham, to be a child of God in your covenant through faith in Christ and that alone. I pray, Lord, that we would walk in your truth to be godly examples and leave a godly heritage for our children, our grandchildren, and the generations after us. Help us, Lord, to be faithful to you in all things. And in Jesus' name we pray. Amen.